My name is Cheyenne, and you are listening to the Between Clean Sheets podcast. You know, you also have the option of watching because when I record video for these episodes, I do put them on YouTube, which is how you would find out if you're not watching already that I am currently Song's front tooth. And if you've been following me on social media, you've probably already heard this story before. If not, I'll tell you, I got my tooth extracted at the end of January and I have an implant that will go in in full at some point in either the end of April or early May. And at the moment, I don't mean to be presenting myself this way, but the problem is earlier today, I somehow misplaced my tooth, my little clip-on, which is a problem. But overall, I've kind of embraced the missing tooth situation because this is hopefully the only time in my life that I'll be dealing with this issue. I also felt weird at the idea of trying to hide it, given, in my mind, how strange the little flipper looks when I put it in and how weird it feels and how even with it in, I have the same kind of lisp that I do when it's not in. I don't know, it's this whole thing. And if you don't know the story, I'll tell you that 15 years ago, I was playing Division Three soccer at a women's college in Georgia. I took a knee to the face, which has created all sorts of issues for my mouth. But for that reason, my four front teeth are crowns. I've had root canals on all of them. I've had surgeries to fix micro fractures in the roots of my forefront teeth. And over Christmas, I was at home with my parents and the crown of this number nine tooth. The only reason I remember the number is because of soccer, by the way. But also I have spent so much time at the dentist in the past 15 years that I've gotten to know the entire industry. <laughs> I have honestly joked that my dentist has become my therapist. And my dentist here in DC actually has a son who plays at the academy in St. Louis, which is a whole other story. But over Christmas, my tooth just straight up fell out, or the crown did. And I was weirdly zen about the whole thing, because with this entire saga, I have had to just let go mentally in order to survive. And I was getting ready to head to Medellin or Medellin, Colombia to visit a friend. And so in this 48 hour period between when it fell out and when I was flying south, I had a temporary fix made by a dentist in my parents' town. And then at the end of January, I just straight up got the tooth extracted, which I just got the dental bill, by the way. And... I think, again, to preserve my mental health, didn't really do much research on the entire process. So I just learned this week, a whole two months later, that I got a bone graft too. I have no idea what was involved. I just knew, given all of the surgeries and procedures I've had, I wanted to be under anesthesia and I was willing to pay for it. I actually had an interview right before this, just a 10 minute little segment for an idea that I have that I want to implement for my podcast episodes going forward, wherein I find somebody on social media, preferably notable in the soccer space, who at any given point in the past week or so shared a bold or controversial opinion and went viral in the sense that it went to the top of the discourse for soccer Twitter that day. And the guest that I had on today to kind of kick this whole series off doesn't necessarily fit that criteria. It wasn't controversial because I think it's common sense, but it was an opinion and it was shared by Washington Post's very own Stephen Goff, who has been writing for the Washington Post about soccer for three decades now has covered DC United the entire time that Major League Soccer has been around and has covered women's World Cups, men's World Cups, has traveled to a ton of different countries and hardly ever shares his opinion, mostly gives it to you straight, mostly breaks news as it comes. This particular article or op-ed 
thread that he wrote titled, By deciding to play on during a FIFA break, MLS further undermines its own season. We cover the three topics discussed in his article, one being the new playoff format, two being what's described in the title, which is Major League Soccer not taking a break at the same time as FIFA this weekend, but playing on. And number three, this newly established League's Cup over the summer, wherein MLS teams will play teams from Liga MX. I don't think MLS is going to be taking an international break during the summer either. And it's been a long-standing issue, actually. MLS has an unconventional schedule compared to all the other clubs in all the other countries. We play from end of February to November. The playoff format restructured a couple of times recently. So at one point we were playing from late February to early December, which is a marathon, by the way. But every other league in the world plays fall to spring, with the idea being that the summer is completely open for things like the World Cup when it's held during the summer, <clears throat> Qatar. So for that reason, obviously, this international window situation has been an issue for Major League Soccer and will continue to be an issue for them. But this particular weekend where we are seeing the beginnings of the Nations League tournament, 90 players, roughly, from Major League Soccer have been called up to their national teams. To put that in perspective, that is a little over 10% of the entire league, and maybe 20 or so of them are younger guys getting called up for U20 matches. That creates a situation wherein games will be played by teams that are missing more than half of their starting lineup. Major League Soccer is just playing on. And from what I read, the reason that the commissioner of MLS, Don Garber, gave is that they are doing their best to work through a very uh, compact schedule. I think that what Stephen Goff shared in this article is very, very common sense. And I completely agree with all of it, actually. And I wanted to give him an opportunity to elaborate and also give some perspective as someone who has written about soccer for longer than I've been alive. But in preparing for this interview, I went on the hunt for my little clip-on tooth and could not find it. So we just went without, which is actually what I've done for a good bit of my content on social media, by the way. I am just embracing my Ovechkin era, really. And while I don't know anything about hockey or really care about hockey, <laughs> I do know that a lot of the best players have mouths that look like this. And they have no intention of replacing their teeth, by the way. They just go without. So I, on the other hand, am really looking forward to having my tooth back and I'm hoping that this is the only time in my life that I'm dealing with this situation. But I'm really excited to kick off this segment idea with Stephen Goff. And I'm hoping that going forward, you who are listening, who are watching, will help me in creating those segments with people who have some bolder, more controversial takes. I will happily take any submissions from people who spend more time than I do on soccer Twitter. Steven, thank you so much for joining me. I know you've been writing for the Washington Post for the longest time. I really wanted to talk to you today about a recent article that you wrote, and I'm very much uh, excited to ask you about it. How are you doing today? Very good. Great to join you and uh, happy to happy to talk some some soccer football with you. Yeah. So you wrote a, a what's called a perspective. I really appreciate that Washington Post called it that. And the title was, By Deciding to Play During a FIFA Break, MLS Further Undermines Its Own Season. And the idea here with this segment of mine is, of course, to talk about things that may be bold or controversial opinions. But when I read this, I thought this makes so much sense. <laughs> and I know you're not one to share 
much of your opinion, especially for the work that you do as a soccer insider for Washington Post. But what really motivated you to share your thoughts on this particular phenomenon? Well, I'd say at the start, you know, um, you know, periodically I'll write these on soccer columns. I've been doing it for a few years now. That's not my, it's not my number one responsibility or, or, or motive in my position, but you know, sometimes there's some things that to, to, you know, to better explain or to engage with the reader, you take a little bit different of approach, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be so always have to be so straightforward and dry. Um, sometimes you can offer a little bit of perspective. I mean, if, you know, I, I hate to use the word opinion because I'm a reporter. I don't really have that many uh, opinions at all anyway. So, uh, you know, all, all the reporters at the post, uh, sports reporters have that flexibility to write these on soccer, on basketball, you know, on baseball type columns. Um, so this was one I felt motivated to do because, you know, on their own, all the, I, I think I pointed out these three, that these three decisions that MLS made that I think hurt the, the regular season. One's the, the expansion of the playoffs. Uh, you know, we, we've seen the playoff numbers grow and grow. I mean, obviously expansion of the league has increased the number of teams and, and, you know, ha, has opened the door for more playoffs, but it's, 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 it's gotten pretty big, the field, the playoff yeah, field. Right. Um, yeah. Well, and I will say Don Garber did not list the growth of the league really as one of his big reasons for changing the yeah. playoff format. He mostly talked about the entertainment value of the postseason. Is that sure. is that an idea you buy or that you think has the credibility that it should have given the huge change? Um, I, you know, I, I think there is a basis to increase the number of do or die matches and, and playoffs bring that, you know, if you have a league that does not have relegation, you know, you want to bring some drama and you do it through, through playoffs. Um, right, so right. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that part of it. Yeah. Um, well, okay. And the other two things that you mentioned yeah. in the article, I'll, I'll let you continue. Yeah. The other things leagues got, which is in its full expansion, uh, this year with, with every MLS team and, and every Liga MX club, you know, that it's taken a huge chunk out of the regular season calendar. You know, it has a potential to be a very good tournament, but again, it's at the expense of MLS's regular season. You know, you're, you're pulling away five weekends where you could have regular season matches. So that was number two. And then this is kind of the, for me, the third strike, then so to speak, in that you know, again, they're going back to playing through international windows. I just right. think, you know, it, you know, you should be following international protocol and taking a break. Yeah, Nations League games aren't like a the biggest deal, and 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 you know, should should league shut down for those things? But all over the world, you know, you got Euro qualifiers, you got African qualifiers, a lot of, lots going on, and you'd think the league would respect that. They don't, right? They'll take a break in October and November, but they're certainly going to play through some of these windows. And anyway, well, all I these have, issues on top of each other. Right. Compounded. Meter. It's all compounded. Yes. And I have two questions that I'm thinking. Do you think sure. Nations League is one thing, but next year with Copa America, when it comes to the U.S., do you see MLS taking a break for that since it's uh, maybe more important? Or, or do you think they're going to plow through with that as well? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, it, for some major tournaments, they've gone, they've gone like halfway, you know, they've, they've taken breaks for group stages, uh, like during past world cups that were in the summer, they would do that and then resume in the later rounds. So no, nah, it's a great question. I mean, you got, you got uh, Copa America, you got the Olympics, you know, and then the world cups coming up here in 2026. Right. What, what, what do you do then? You know, are you taking a month off? Are you taking six weeks off? Um, are you going to play, you know, two half season? I, I don't know, but certainly there's some big decisions that the league's going to have to make in terms of absolutely. Their so, and I read a couple of quotes, great quotes actually, by coaches in your article. Sure. One of my thoughts was from the player perspective. I mean, if if I'm not mistaken, over fifty percent of the league itself are foreign players, and for a lot of the ninety players that have 
been called up for this particular international break representing your country is uh, such a huge honor um, and, and something that I think a lot of the American players in Major League Soccer have had a, an interesting situation with given the split that we see between players that are still in Major League Soccer versus players who have gone gone abroad to play. But from a player perspective, what's the what's the other side of the catch-22 here? I mean, how does that impact them fr from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think you have a situation where your club is going about its business and you are off uh, for, you know, a week and a half on international duty. Some players could feel like they're going to lose their spot on their club in the lineup. Could affect playing time if someone else comes in and plays well. It's the nature of soccer. You know, players <laughs> come and go <laughs> yes. for, for all kinds of reasons, whether it's, you know, a Champions League or international duty or, you know, domestic cups. There's always something going on. And, you know, the pl lineups change. Players place established veterans in the lineup and they do well and they keep the job. I mean, so that's, that's how soccer works. And, um, right. Players understand that, but certainly in this case, it's a little bit different because it's, it just doesn't seem necessary. And you're putting, <laughs> putting some players in, the, in a tough spot. Yeah. It's, I think the condensed calendar, all the different the newly created tournament that, that is the league's cup. I, I am wondering who gets a, a season ending injury first, who ends up dealing with maybe tired, tired legs that they wouldn't have had to, to necessarily manage as, as early. But I will ask you one last question before we go. Of the three things that you mentioned in this article, the international break, the new playoff format, and then the league's cup, which of those three do you see changing or ceasing to exist either the lack of international break observance the the existence of leaks cup the playoff format etc come 2024 maybe even 2025 which of those do you think is most likely to be changed or nixed yeah i mean i think leagues cups here for here to stay i mean there's just too much money at stake uh there's tv money there's um the, the marketing opportunities with with the mexican clubs more games for stadiums to host. So that's sad. I don't, I don't think that's going to change at all. I think playoffs will always evolve. I mean, whether it's the format or the number of teams, you know, if, based on history, MLS will, will change it again at some point, right. probably, right. probably sooner <laughs> rather than later. The other thing is the windows, you know, I, I mean, they, they seem to have a greater respect for the windows. I mean, I didn't go through it year by year, but it seemed like they were getting better at it. And then Maybe they reverted a little bit this year. So I get it. There aren't a lot of dates available. Um, you got to get, you got to take advantage of, of the weekends during the calendar when possible. But man, it's, uh, it, it's, it's tough on, it's probably unfair to the players, unfair to clubs. Um, right, right. It's a tough situation for everybody, I think. Well, and I'll end with this. As someone who creates content from the fan POV, one of your last sentences in your article is absolutely one of my favorite, which is, given all that's going on, it would be fair to wonder what incentives are left for fans to care about a Colorado-Houston midseason match. Yeah, and ben to that, wasn't I happy say... About that line. <laughs> you what? <laughs> ben Wilson wasn't happy about that line. Yeah, no. oh, yeah I forgot. Well, I... I I, I was going to say, as a fan, I forget that Houston is a team sometimes. And <laughs> as someone who has been doing fantasy uh, MLS for about six, seven years now, this year we all remarked after our draft was over that not a single Houston player was even drafted. So, and and I'm plugged in. I'm very plugged in. So to me, I think, man, if, if I'm not getting excited about that, then you're absolutely right. How do you drum up that excitement? So. I'm actually really looking forward to maybe reconvening with you toward the end of the season or even mid-season to, to get a little uh, pulse check. But I really appreciate you, A, writing that article, but um, B, talking to me about it today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Anytime. Today's podcast is sponsored by Colt Kits, the best place to find original vintage jerseys for your favorite clubs, both home and abroad. 
And if you want to go full kit wanker, they have a great collection of shorts, socks, and boots. Cleats. They're called cleats. I'm so excited to join the Creator Collective team at Colt Kits, especially because each purchase you make using my code helps support the content you're about to enjoy. For 10% off your purchase from coltkits.com, click the link in my bio or use the code Cheyenne10 when you check out. We are going to continue this episode with what I would call maybe some soccer adjacent content. My dad, he's retired. And he thrifts a lot. He has like a little Amazon book business, eBay book business. He spends a lot of time at their stores in Southeast Georgia and has procured very interesting things for me uh, in his quest to find things that will actually sell for more money, such as this MLS decal set, which is clearly from 2000, hmm, maybe 2019. It's got the old New England Revolution logo on it, the old, old Chicago Flyer logo before their disastrous rebrand and then their rebrand, rebrand. What I intend on doing with that, I have no idea, but whenever he finds interesting artifacts like that, that he thinks I would find interesting, I have a hard time saying no, you know? This particular book that I am unboxing comes with the signature Paul Foster stamp collection. He's got a ton of interesting stamps. These are two two $2 stamps with Bobcats on them. And then a (laughs) 1988 Olympics stamp with a male gymnast on it. He did tell me what was coming, but I completely forgot because I do believe it's in a sea of unread text messages on my phone. You guys know I'm very bad at responding to texts, but it's a book and it's called The One Thing, The Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results by Gary Keller with Jay Papasan. Interesting. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul Richard. Don't worry, I have another. We are in a season of unboxing, particularly because... I am starting to work with a couple of different brands and getting PR packages. Uh, hold for applause. You're, you're a little baby's growing up to be an influencer. Specifically, Colt Kits, which is a kit company based in the UK, who sent me a package. Oh my gosh, it had to be in December, maybe early January. And I cannot even begin to tell you how embarrassing it was to reach back out to them and tell them that I couldn't do the unboxing they asked for because the package was stolen from my front doorstep. And I live in like a four unit building with a front door. And I'm not surprised because I've gotten plenty of things stolen, but it was Oh, it was just really embarrassing to explain that to like a full blown company and ask them if they would send me something else. And by the time they did, it had to be delivered to DHL's like distribution center in DC. And then I drove to get it because I didn't want it to be left on my front doorstep, even if I was home, which I have been mostly for those of you who don't know. And you should definitely know by now, but I feel like I do have to announce it on each new platform. I left my job in politics almost definitely over, yeah, over two months ago now. And I have not looked back. I cannot tell you how freeing the feeling is. There are so many reasons for why I just wasn't in it anymore. And I have done a really good job for the most part of keeping that life of mine, maybe my real life is what I used to call it, and this soccer life separate. They have intertwined here and there, not by any choice of mine. The more that I have existed in that political space doing what I have done, the less fulfilling it's been for me and the more anxiety it has given me. And I just really reached a point where I was feeling physically ill at the thought of going into work and I really I really could not do it anymore so the past two months have been great for me even still working from home 
I am a victim of theft. So I'm actually really glad that all of these packages made it to me. One being the cult kits box, which I have to unbox for a separate video, you know, influencer things. But then also the book from my dad. But this particular box is from my good friend, Taylor. She is my best friend from college, currently lives in Tokyo, which is going through its own cherry blossom thing. So we have that to bond over. But interestingly enough, we also went to college in the cherry blossom capital of the country, Macon, Georgia. So we're very familiar with this season of everyone's lives. And the cherry blossom kit from DC United is well overdue. So I am excited about it. But that excitement is kind of clouded by two things. One, feeling like it's a too little too late situation. And two, wishing that the design was a little bit different. I do love some of the other cherry blossom concept apparel items that they've come out with, but I won't share my thoughts in that capacity. I've tried to be really positive with the things that have been happening because I want to encourage positive evolution when I see it happening in the smallest of increments. So hopefully we get to a point where we're like really pushing the envelope, you know? Speaking of envelope, back to the package. This is not an attempt at ASMR, and I'm also not gonna cut out this noise for those of you just listening. <sighs> because if I have to do any more effort to get an episode out into the atmosphere, it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> okay, so, and by the way, I know exactly what this is, which is why I mentioned cherry blossoms. Every single year, Starbucks in Japan comes out with a cherry blossom line, and Taylor and her husband, Brian, who is a big soccer fan, Taylor, not so much, but she's willing to oblige, and they actually took their daughter to their first soccer game in Tokyo a couple weeks ago, which was so precious, by the way. I'm getting off topic. Every year, the Starbucks in Japan does a specific line of four cherry blossoms for the cherry blossom season. And last year, Taylor said she either missed out on it or maybe didn't participate, not realizing how much of a hot commodity some of these items were. So this year, she made a specific effort. And if you're not watching, it is a baby thermos. But not the baby thermos that I wanted, by the way. I think the one that I picked out, Taylor told me, was super small, like meant for your purse. This one is the next best option, and it is extremely cute. It's got pink, purple, blue, pastel colors with, of course, cherry blossom design, and then these like holographic little dots and outlines. So I don't know how many ounces this holds. It has... Oh, 355 milliliters. Yet another way in which the United States just insists on doing things differently from every other country, because I don't know what milliliters are to ounces. Just like I don't know why we're not taking an international break. <laughs> Taylor, thank you so much for this. I will be using it, obviously, for my team. It does remind me of the Adidas kit that just came out for Japan in preparation for the Women's World Cup. And it is the same color scheme actually as this thermos, but the colors are more bold. And it was specifically designed to represent a sunset over Mount Fuji. I actually think Taylor and her husband Brian can see Mount Fuji from their window. I really, really want to go visit them. Tangent for just a sec. I had bought a flight to visit them in August and was going to leave after I went to the DC United at LAFC match. I don't know which one I planned first, but I do know that the idea was flying out of Los Angeles would be a lot easier to get to Tokyo. I had made the plans in hopes that by the time we reached August of 2022, Japan would be open for tourists, and it didn't end up opening to tourists, I think, until October. So what ended up happening there was this idea that I had floated to possibly go to the World Cup came to fruition when I had this credit on American Airlines 
for the flight that I was no longer taking to Tokyo. And I flew Qatar Airways with their partnership with American to Doha and ended up going to the World Cup instead. But I do have every intention of going to Tokyo, hopefully this year, if not next year. This kit, though, is, it is one of, I believe, eight for countries like Spain, Germany, Colombia, Costa Rica, I think, that are specific to the ecosystem in those respective countries. And I am so incredibly jealous of them all. I hate that I like the cherry blossom kit less because of these, because these are incredibly bold and beautiful concepts. And I would much prefer a bold attempt and failure than a safe choice. Adidas has done a lot for some teams and kits. I'm specifically thinking of Seattle Sounders Bruce Lee kit. But looking at these kits just makes me feel like we could do better. We could do so much better. <sighs> anyway, thank you so much for tuning in wherever you're coming from. Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple, YouTube. Do me a favor and be honest. It doesn't have to be five stars if you don't want it to be. But review the podcast and maybe message me about your thoughts on the interviews that I've done, which are timeless, by the way. So if you didn't listen to them when they first came out, they're there. They're there for you. Let me know what you think of them publicly, privately, and maybe share them if you feel like it with your friends and loved ones and also your girlfriends, your wives, and your sisters, because we are forever on a quest to balance the demographics of my social media following. I love uh, the community that I've built so far, but I could always welcome more women in the space in general, which is why I'm here. And on that note, thank you so much. Peace, love, and soccer.